This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. This weekend, you can take a journey on the A-Train. The solo comedy opens tonight in Hartford at Heartbeat Ensemble. A-Train is written and performed by Annie Torsilieri. In the play, she takes the audience on her journey, coming to terms with her son's autism diagnosis. I'm happy to say Annie's joining us here in studio with us on Where We Live. Annie Torsilieri, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to meet you. So you're a writer and performer of A-Train. I do it all. <laughs> we like people that hold mul- that wear multiple hats. <laughs> yes. uh, I was reading on your website when you um, wrote this play, uh, you said you'd like A-Train to do for autism what the vagina monologues has done for vaginas. That's right. That catches people's attention. Hopefully, yeah. So tell us a little bit about, this is a personal story of, of your journey when you learned one of your children um, was diagnosed with autism, but why put it on stage? What prompted you? Well, great question. I'm an actor by uh, trade and by heart, and I'm a great believer in the power of theater. So there you go. Um, I find we can translate the human experience to the audience through seeing a live performance. I mean, of course, movies and TV are great in their own right, not putting them down. (laughs) And someday maybe A-Train will be on one of those (laughs) forums. I don't know. But uh, the stage is... uh, It's one of those things. It's live. It's in the moment. There's this human being in front of you experiencing something. And hopefully you as the audience are able to go along on that journey and actually really understand what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes. So that's part of it. And, of course, you know, as an actor, I want to translate what I know best to the stage. And this is what I am living Mm 24-7. So it seemed a natural fit. The other thing is, is I want to make a difference, hopefully, uh, in the small little way that I can um, by getting word out there about one person's experience, one family's experience. And additionally, I do share the points of view of many of the people I interviewed in the autism world, uh, especially those who identify as autistic themselves. So I use their verbatim words in the piece. So you get to hear a lot of different people's point of view. Mm. Why a comedy? (laughs) <laughs> because if you can't laugh, you got to cry. So I don't I can't imagine anyone would want to just sit in a drama mm-hmm. for 90 minutes about autism. That sounds kind of dire to me. Um, a comedy is the way to let an experience in. I mean, that's that's my take on comedy in general. That's how I live my life. Uh, if I can laugh about it, if I can make other people laugh about it, if I can entertain them while I'm opening their hearts and minds, hopefully I'm doing a good job. Uh, We don't want to give too much away uh, for our listeners who may have tickets or thinking about it uh, after they hear you uh, speak to us, Annie. Uh, But explain a little bit about how you took the story, your story, um, on stage. Uh, Again, it's a solo comedy, so you're writing, performing. uh, But why A-Train? Well, um, of course, it started, when I started writing the piece, it was called A Word, A being autism, like the unspoken word. You remember back in the day when people wouldn't say the word cancer or divorce. Um, And now it's more out in the open, thank goodness, but I want to reduce the stigma about autism. And so... um, It started with that, and then my son's story greatly involves trains because a lot of people on the autism spectrum have a special interest, and his special interest is trains, particularly subway trains. We grew up in New York. The boys lived there till they were five. By age four, he had the whole subway line memorized, and that has been a huge focus in our lives, so it seemed a natural confluence to move the play from being a word to a train. And the whole play takes place within the framework of a subway trip. So we have subway stops along the way. I won't give it away. I won't give away what they're called. But uh, it takes place on a subway platform. And it's the journey from the beginning of a train all the way to the end. 
Annie Tersilieri is in studio with me here on Where We Live. She's writer and performer of A Train. It opens tonight at the Heartbeat Ensemble in Hartford. Again, it tells uh, her uh, story uh, when she learned one of her sons was diagnosed with autism. And you can learn more about this play on our website, wmpr.org slash where we live. Uh, Annie, you mentioned earlier that you talked with uh, people um, who have some experience with autism. Maybe it's a, a relative or a loved one or they're on the spectrum. So what did they tell you and how did that inform the message that you wanted to put out there while you're on stage? Well, I talked to people that I knew from the community, so neighbors, um, local professionals, teachers, and then I really I went to autism conferences, and I really wanted to make it a priority to speak with people who identify as autistic themselves because that's the, you know, going to the horse's mouth, so to speak. Um, Boy, I learned so much. Uh, it was really hard to get it down into a 90-minute show because when I started, I think the first read-through I did, which was at the Lark Theater in New York City, it was five hours. <laughs> <laughs> and most of that was just quotes from people because each one was a jewel, you know, and I really wanted to honor the experience of all these people that had trusted me with their stories and, and taken the time. So I had all these recordings. I transcribed them, pages and pages and pages, I mean, hours and hours of material. Um, and I sort of whittled it down to a, a few sort of different viewpoints. One of the things that I found early on in the autism community, and I think it is still true today, is that uh, there are two very different camps. The one camp in the show I call the neurodiversity camp. That's not a term that I have coined, but that's certainly um, the viewpoint that uh, we have many different kinds of minds and brains and experiences, and I certainly believe that to be true, um, one of which we is labeled in the medical community neurotypical, and now this new emergence of neurodiversity. So that, among other things, are people on the autism spectrum, a different way of your neurology working. And those people tend to be in the, in the camp of um, really what we need is acceptance and celebration of these differences. And that's a beautiful thing. There's another very different take on autism, which in my play I call the Danger Will Robinson camp. <laughs> For those of us who are old enough to remember Lost in Space, um, that might ring a bell. <laughs> These are the people, they tend to be folks who are really experiencing more stress because of their experience with autism, whether it's themselves personally or family members. And they're sort of saying, yes, we need to celebrate. Yes, we need acceptance. But oh my gosh, we are drowning here. We need help. We are freaking out. So let's not sugarcoat this as, you know, unicorns pooping rainbows. We got some problems here, and we really need more services. We really need more research. We really need more supports, especially for people who are aging out of the system. Mm. Uh, what's going to happen to these kids? The numbers are increasing, and this isn't all, you know, sunshine and teddy bears. This is a problem that we have to deal with. So those two camps uh, really kind of differ, and you'd think there'd be more overlap and cooperation, and I hope that there will be as we move forward. But Can I ask, uh, Annie, when you um, discovered uh, that one of your uh, sons uh, was, being, uh, was diagnosed with autism, what went through your mind? Was it first fear? And then at that time um, of when you got the diagnosis, did you feel like you knew where to turn? Great questions. Well, you really got to come see the show to get the, the real answers. But uh, I'll suffice it to say that I was freaked out. I knew nothing about autism except the stereotypes, you know, Rain Man and all that. And uh, I had no idea what the future held for my son. And of course, none of us know the futures for any of our children or any of ourselves. I mean, that's a little fallacy we like to comfort ourselves with, that we know what's coming up down the pike. But um, in this case, we really didn't know. And I should mention that um, I have twins. So for us, we could see a really big difference between our two boys, um, one of whom is 
on the spectrum and one of whom is just a piece of work, (laughs) as I like to say. So right off the bat, we could see some big differences. And we were really scared. We were really worried. And we just did not know how to proceed. Uh, Things have gotten much better since then, both for our family, but in the world of autism. There are a lot more resources now. There's a lot more awareness. Thank goodness a lot more places for um, newly diagnosed families to turn for for guidance. But this was, um, let's see, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. There was not as much then. And we were freaking out. Yeah. This was a years-long process uh, to put a train uh, on the stage uh, after you thought about it and wrote about it and did the research. Uh, What's been the feedback? What are you hearing? Wow, the feedback feedback has been so... um, humbling and encouraging. It has given me the courage to kind of move forward and continue to try to improve the piece, try to rewrite, try to make it better, try to really get it out there to the world because I I hope that it can do some good. I mean, the, the feedback's been, ver- been very encouraging, both from people who have no experience with autism and want to learn more and kind of are like, oh, wow, that's what it's like. Wow, okay, that's a, an insight. Now I have a different perspective, as well as and almost more um, powerfully from the families who are living it and saying, wow, yes, this touched on so many points that we've been living through and how great to know that other people are going through it. And thank you for sharing this story. We just have a couple of minutes left, uh, Annie, but could you tell us uh, briefly about how you incorporated music, even art, into this, uh, this play? Yes. Well, I should mention that we have an amazing composer, Brad Carroll, an amazing director, Risa Brainin, wonderful designer and production coordinator, Michael Clares. And M- Brad wrote uh, music for which I had created the lyrics. And um, we also have incorporated artwork from incredible artists, all of whom identify as autistic, in collaboration with a group called The Art of Autism, curated by one of their founders, Kerry Bowers. And the artwork is astounding, and it's another glimpse into the hearts and minds and souls of these people who have a different way of um, experiencing life and sharing their their insights via their art. And um, I hope you'll come see it. Mm. Uh, your children are in their teens now. Yes. Um, the son that has been diagnosed with autism, has he seen the play? He has not seen the play. His twin brother saw the play for the first time a few months ago, and he was sort of taken aback by how difficult the journey was um, for us at the beginning. And because I think, and the reason my son on the spectrum has not seen it is because we have never presented autism to him as anything like a problem, per se. I mean, he knows there are challenges, but he also knows that he has autism superpowers, as we call them. He has a lot of gifts, as does everyone. Um, And we never wanted to scare him about it or make him feel stigmatized or make him worried. We wanted, we present it in our family very much like some people have brown eyes, some people have blue eyes, some people are left-handed, some people are right-handed, some people's brains work this way, some people's brains work this way. And so the story of the play really goes into the fear and the anxiety. Um, Of course, it comes out the other side to acceptance, but I think that would be upsetting to him at this point. I think he'll see it when he's older. Um, Also, you know, Trains are his beloved, beloved uh, modes of expression, and I struggle with trains in the play, and I think that would be a little horrifying to him. <laughs> Well, this sounds like a a really wonderful uh, play, again, that's opening tonight at the Heartbeat Ensemble's Carriage House Theater in Hartford. A-Train, opening tonight all the way through March 3rd. Annie Torsilieri, thank you so much for coming in today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. We have more information on our website, wmpr.org slash where we live. Today's show produced by Lydia Brown. Thanks to our technical producer, Kion Wolf, Seth Blair on the phones. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. As always, thanks for listening. 